supposed to basically now explain it back to their, you know, to present it and someone can ask them question, different type of question, and they have to be able to answer. So what are the very core, you know, the, the not the news element, you know, like if you really read about Wave 3 and blockchain, most of the time what you get is some news thing, like, you know, or news means journalists or whoever describe about it, about like, oh, it's a distributed ledger, does that, but no one tells you about the code, like, you know, what happens actually, so how does it handle, how are it's implemented, if you are now to try to start working on it, to implement a, you know, an example, a hello world blockchain, what do you do, you know, so you should be able to answer that kind of question, some details, like, oh, what is the hash, what do I do, um, and at the same time, what does it mean blocked, and what does it mean, where does it come, what is the data, where is memory? Where is it stored? How is it stored? Things like that. So you should be able to understand this type of question. Okay. So if you don't understand it, I want you to basically ask me. And so I'm just going to start just for eye opener. Okay. Um, so that you, it starts the question. So just the first part is, you know, what is, whenever we say Web3, just the three part, usually you can ask, them, for example, if someone says four IR or the fourth industrial revolution, then you have to ask, what does it mean for? Is it just, sometimes people just put it to mean something, uh, but in this case, four is a number and it, uh, there must be then, there must be something first first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, third industrial revolution, and then the fourth industrial revolution, right? So just like that, the first industrial revolution was just steam engines, second industrial revolution was electricity, fourth industrial revolution was computing and computers, and then uh, the fourth industrial is basically whatever we are now experiencing, AI, blockchain, uh, quantum computing, as well as also uh, nanotubes and, and all that, right? So the same as here, when, if you are talking about wave three, it's, there is wave one and wave two. And unfortunately there is no wave zero. So, and you know, one way to think of wave one was, it was basically not dynamic, right? It was a static information that's posted. Um, it may have, you know, I think part of the wave one was also flash animation, you, know, you can have animations, but it's not user-based. It's not like users are not uh, interacting with it. It's not dynamic. Right? So that all that comes and changed, especially when Google and Facebook came and where basically the way we know the way has evolved to really respond to multiple um, dynamic cookies and all that, you know, it, it understands, it keeps a state and it's read write and you, you interact with it, right? So that's platform based is a way to whatever you call it. That's why, you know, Facebook, YouTube, WordPress, whatever is made web two. And in a wave one, you have this the Yahoo version, Netscape, Internet Explorer, all of those were like kind of part of information economy, platform economy. And then now web three is called token economy um, in some way. And in the token economy, you have, of course, Bitcoin, you know, Ethereum, as well as also all the form of things. It basically uh, allows you, in another way of to look at it, it allows you, the user, not only platforms, are able to exchange economy within it. If you had Web2, Google can put cookies and Google can then advertise based on that and sell that, but you are unable to do that, right? So it's like, it's not an equal partner, right? The platforms have more than the users. The users can only consume. In the Web3, it's trying to put everybody um, basically a, a beneficiary, and that's what's called token economy. So in another way that I like to, it's called read, um, it's in the web one, 
you can think of it as a read-only permission. In, in two, in web two, you can think of it as read and write. And then in, in web three, you can think of it read, write, and execute. So that's basically the, you know, just a good way to look at it. Again, what is Ledger? For some of you, you don't have to know. I think, you know, I, I really didn't know what Ledger is, but Ledger is basically, when you know it, it's just, okay, it's whatever you write, uh, input outputs. Like if you are in a shop and if you are selling, you know, what you are selling and you're recording that transaction element is normally is called Ledger. Ledger has been there since the beginning of time, right? Whoever is selling puts how much they sold or borrowed or stuff like that. And that's basically the ledger. And now these ledgers, of course, banks have ledgers as part of a database, or it's called transactional databases. But now this the distributed ledger is what um, what is kind of blockchain. It, it is nothing more invention, but you could actually it is the generalization of a higher form of just this ledger because by just only that looking at the transactions without actually giving an account to any person. But for example, let's imagine here, the names, it's only people like uh, that are there, like somebody took something, something, something. Now, as soon as you put a name there, that person must be receiving the first time because they, they can't send. Let's imagine this ledger is like someone sends and receives. Now, as soon as you put one name there, then that person, if it was the first time, they must receive only, they cannot own. Before that, they don't exist in the system. But then after that, they don't need to have an account because now they received, so they must have an account. And then, then they can also send because now they have received. So within this ledger, they actually have now a value. That means they have received something, we trust that. And then they can, we can allow them to transfer because we know within that system, if that system is now the universe, within that system and they don't, you know, it doesn't leak, that means they don't go and take it out from another place, then this system, you can trust it to be everything because whoever is, his name is appeared here, they must have an account. So you don't have to create an account for them. That's Bitcoin. It's a distributed ledger, okay? And a contract is of course, another element that whenever things needs to be agreed, there has to be a contract. Uh, between you know two individuals and then a contract it needs in a normal contract it needs of course the, some kind of uh, legality for it to be enforced uh, at least within the human system and that legality there there is of course a whole set of around it there are people who understand the legal issue you know they call them software programmers in this case lawyers and then there is, uh, of course, paper, you know, auditors, whatever. But ultimately, they um, they basically function such that a contract that is written in a certain form, because the law, you know, you can't just simply write a contract. You have to mention certain code, whatever. Within that, it is validable, and that two people can settle any conflict. Contract is ultimately. Uh, assumes that you, you know, trust is not the only thing. Uh, that means it's, it's between, for example, you don't need contract between two APIs that there are no human interaction, right? Because the, you know, it's just basically you only, you only need protocol. So in, in between APIs, like for example, HTTP is a protocol because you assume between two computers, there shouldn't be that much trust issue. Of course, HTTPS is when there are hackers that you, you get that kind of um, element added. But in this case, just if you assume just the HTTP protocol, it's a protocol. It's only a way of for them to talk. It's a language uh, way of you know saying hi and and then uh, exchanging some information. A contract really assumes that there is some form of um, trust issue. And there might be, we might not, we right now we might have really lots of trust between, you know, between us, but ultimately if we expect that there might be some conflict and we want to deal that in an intelligent way, then we need a contract that's predefined um, uh, such that we don't, we don't really necessarily when we have a conflict that there's a certain issue. Okay. 
So the usual way, of course, currently that happens is that uh, normally it is not through a contract, but it's two individuals, even if they don't know each other, they don't trust each other. What they do is that they exchange based on a third party that we all put trust on. And that person has, of course, a legal responsibility, how to act in a responsible way. Usually, like if it's financial, it's banks uh, or central banks. And then basically anyone without trusting each other, they can send, of course, to each other um, money or any financial things. And that's the usual way. But that means there's somebody that is always contro in control. And that person, if they, if they just ignore you, because let's say you wrongly are labeled let's say you are from a certain place and you are wrongly labeled like you are not um you know you're, you you can't access bank then even if you have money you can't access it right so that's really for some for most of the time it's okay but you know you realize if it's between countries now the us being the dollar controller you know if they don't want russia to to, to kind of use dollar they impose on them and you know that's you don't want that kind of thing this is just too much power on individuals, however they are legal in their own. But within a bigger scale, you really don't want that kind of thing. Like, uh, and that's why, of course, people or like the blockchain concept gets traction is that you don't want, it's not about like what you think of legals and controls, whatever, but if you want, if you can't, you really want to remove those people so that then they don't influence, like, you know, because tomorrow it could be you. You know, today is Russia, but tomorrow it's, you know, some banks like Germany, right? So people have a certain in intake. So that's why blockchain is trying to do this thing, ledger, the kind of writing the ledger in a trustworthy way by solving some kind of conflicts in a certain protocol uh, and by not, by not, by being a system, not, not individuals or central agencies. Okay. So that's why. You know, banks are called central agencies. So when you say centralized and then decentralized, still there could be multiple uh, centrals, but they they are not, there's no one center, um, but there are multiple centers. Again, that's, and then there is called distributed and um, distributed are actually really what blockchain is. It's not centralized, it's not decentralized, but it's distributed, okay? Um, so, but the real problem that these distributed systems are trying to solve are, it's actually consensus, to form consensus, because you, you can do it. Like I can send, you can send, we can all talk to each other, but they, we will not have consensus what I talk to one person in this case, um, and then what I, call, what I talk to another person, the other person might not receive or might not agree on what two of us, for example, I, I said, okay, I'm sending uh, money, and then, but then uh, someone else can say like, no, like an idea, for example, could just say like, I don't respect that Fisaha has money now, like because you sent it. And how do we form some kind of consensus? And that is really what, of course, the very, very big challenge. Now, you know, distributed system in many places, you know, most of clouds are distributed, but because as I say, clouds, whatever are APIs, they don't need, they are, you don't expect people are trying to cheat there. Or that means there are no people, there are systems and it's defined, it's protocol governs it. So you don't expect as long as of course you secure it and it's private because Google or Facebook or whatever controls them. So, you know, you don't expect anything you expect um they they don't need that there's no issue with consensus so um and that's why when you are open system and actually in a hostile environment hostile environment means like distributed systems of machines computing machines there isn't you don't expect one machine to be hostile you know like maybe the people who use that machine can be hostile but you know, you don't expect, and then if you don't give that that access to those hostile people, you can control it. So there is no, you know, but really what blockchain is solving is consensus in a hostile environment. In a hostile environment means like people have really, really a reason to cheat.
to be hostile, to take over, because it's money, they, they can take over, right? So they will think every day and night to hack you. And, and, and then they are part of that system. So that means that you will never be able to trust anyone in that system. And then you have to create consensus. So consensus in a hostile environment is what blockchain is addressing, right? So other things like that, you know, that addresses consensus, but in a normal environment are called Kafka, HBase, MongoDB, Zookeeper, are all trying to, of course, consensus with, in terms of message passing, right? Like if you have like this publish and subscribe model, of course, you need to synchronize as, as well. There, there, there needs to be something kind of uh, um, consensus, but for, for example, Zookeeper does that, but that is consensus in a normal environment. But consensus in a hostile environment is what, what basically blockchain addresses. Let me stop there and then let's have some discussions. How are questions or are we sleeping? It's afternoon in most places. Ask me something that that is in your head, in your mind, that you either understand or you don't understand. Either you confirm or you do some hypothesis testing in your head. Well, I think it's pretty clear up until this point for me personally. Okay. I really don't have any question. I just wanted to know more about this thing, you know, rather than asking a question. Just yeah, but it, it, it is surprising how the tendency to know more actually means passive listening. Because then when it's active, you are actually grasping more. I mean, let's call it, uh, uh, in my opinion, again, I can be absolutely wrong, uh, but it's a broadband when you are active. That means when you are asking questions, when, when you are forming questions. Um, that means you are referring, you are forming different connections between existing knowledge and the current knowledge. Whenever you are listening it, it's just sitting alone most of the time. Um, and so that's why people, of course, try to encourage questions so that connections form and you don't forget it. Uh, but absolutely, I, I, I respect, the, yeah, there is more to come, so it's okay. How does blockchain manage the ledgers? Yep, that's where we are coming. That's also a good question. Any questions so far in any form to, to help form connections? So no, for example, I'm also, yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I, I just wanted to know, is Agorand like a blockchain? Yeah, it's like a uh, Bitcoin and exactly. Yeah, it's like Bitcoin. It's like oh. Ethereum. They're all blockchains. So it's a blockchain. Okay. okay. It's a network. Right? It's, it's a network. A blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So I intentionally, I would have liked some people to ask me about Zookeeper or Kafka. How that is. I mean, if you understand it, that's great. But because these are, you have done, you have seen Zookeeper. Uh, probably you didn't. Okay, sorry. Maybe that. Did you run Kafka? No, it's in the future. Okay. Um, but some of you probably know MongoDB and and distributed uh, systems. So that's why I want intentionally to link with that one. So, anyways, so the very first, of course, blockchain is nothing more than some clever stacking and clever use of cryptography, you know, cryptography. And cryptography, you have seen it again and again everywhere in your life. And part of them, we asked you last time to generate um, public key and private key for SSH. That's also cryptography. That's exactly, you know, you can think of it that one. Um, if, if I was providing you the cloud, that was just more blockchain. You know, basically, I was creating accounts for you in that sense. So, of course, the the very essential part to understand, of course, in cryptography is that 
what does it mean private key what does it mean public key right so private key is the okay let me just close just give me one minute Hello. No, it's okay, just yes, it's fine. And and so yeah, so in 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 blockchain, so like um, in cryptography, you know what really makes cryptography, of course, um, really good and strong, is that it's a type of it's a mathematics, right? It's kind of in in high school you have learned functions. It's a type of function. Um, it's called you know some form of elliptic curve multiplication, but what you do is that it's really this is an essential component so you have to understand you have to ask if you don't understand what i'm saying you generate a private key a private key is anything anything that is just depending on what allows it's a byte order so you just random random thing you can you, your private key can be one to ten one two three four five six seven eight nine ten you know, whatever it's um or it can be a uh, of course, in a normal time, you would just be generating both character and other things, not only numbers, but just any random character, let's call it, of a certain size. And the size of the key depend matters most, of course, on, on how strong whatever it is. But it's just a random number that you generate. This is just, you have to know, private key is just a random number you generate, okay? So that's the one you know. And you generate something and then you go with an elliptic multiplication that's basically assume it this is a type of mathematics that's the essential element you turn that one into a public key okay now the most important part about a public key is that one given a public key and given the private key plus some message that is you know so you you basically form a private you know you, you basically hash it's called hash i'll come to it so you hash anything with that private key and then if you had already that message class public key you will be able to confirm that it was it was the private key that generated this public key that actually coded this thing so you will be able to do that you are unable to go the other side. You, if you, if I give you my public key or you gave me already your public key, there is no way so that that's what is called, you know, now, whenever you think of, if you heard about quantum cryptography, whatever, it's how long does it take to go from this public key to private key? That's, that's the issue. In principle, in a classical time, no, with the classical computers, the number of times that you would need, the number of, it's just almost crazy infinite. That's why cryptography is safe. You know, just just as long as you don't expose the, the private key, you know, nobody can infer or crack your private key. Just the public key is secure. Okay, so that's the, that's the whole point. So you gave me the public key, the, you generated the private key. That's it. Just like for anything, right? Whether it's blockchain, whether it's SSH, it's the same, identical. It's the same process. It's the type of function that you use different, but it's just different now to form i mean this is just much more of the for additional thing it's nothing got to do this is everything up and seen but to form some kind of of course uh, uh, bitcoin uh, uh, address sometimes we transform it because as i said here the private key and public key can be very long right it can be people generate usually 2048 or 4086 kind of uh, digits to make it strong so you really you know just using that byte or of data as as an address sometimes is really waste of you know if you think of billion people will have that that's a waste of memory right so to in order to reduce that bitcoin of course introduced as well as also to help security to double hash double hash means you take that one you use sha 256 a hasher 
and then another uh, right made 160 hasher and then you basically hash that so those that public key transforms into this one and then you get this public key hash okay and then after that you convert it into base 58 checking code and then you get basically the bitcoin address that's it unable of course the thing about it is that you are unable to go from here given that there is also a hash here you are unable to go to of course to the, the first public key as well so um just for added security but bitcoin address means just this your public key transformed um and then now given this there is also a way you know basically to confirm that uh if you have to pass this public key actually um and then and then the message and then you have to sign with your private key and then basically the three of that so a signed version so a signed version means some kind of hashed version the hashed version can be checked when the public key times the message will ensure will make sure that you know it is the private key that generate the public key that that signed so it can confirm that in a very secure way that's basically the whole point of signing that means you sign as individual that i give money to fsa i sign with my private key now how much i give the, so the messaging part is that i would just say like let's let's put it i yeah but yeah, gave the saha you know uh, five dollars okay that's a message then i take that message and then i use my private key and i put together and i hash them and then i send that hash plus my public key and then of course no one would be able to tamper let's imagine if they now change slightly the message instead of now fasa knowing that he is a receiver or fasa and uh, somebody else uh, for example um Adiyat kind of talked and say like okay let's just change you know think of five thousand five dollar of course to be five million in this case it makes sense right let's make it six million of course if they are able to do that they i really lose but if they do it six million they now change the message now that message is now is not the one that i i hashed so then when my public key plus the modified message comes in it will say okay it's different it is the, the hash that the person gave and the hash now that is generated with, with public key and Navara, it doesn't match so then you know it's not the same so but if the public key and the, the exact message comes in anyone can confirm that the hash is correct so that, that that's uh, the point so um yeah hopefully then you can actually go to to this one you can actually create you can uh, invoke this one um but that's what earlier i was also let me stop here so this is what the hash is basically okay so there is a private key built in inside there and this is the hash of it i can you know like whenever i change the message let's say in this case f uh, to um you see now, now if this was the one that that is the hash determined but now if i change even just a small dot see like it's completely changed right so that's a hash so basically a message of that form is hashed with a private key transformed it this way okay then that's the kind of hash now to of course you can form a block like we'll, we'll come to it but that's basically just a demonstration of that anyways um and so in a blockchain basically blockchain now so we talked about just a hash um, questions i like questions any question for sam yeah so uh how how does how does the, they know which uh 
I, I guess it's an algorithm, which algorithm to use. Because depend, depending on the algorithm, I think the hash is going to change, right? Yeah, so but that's why like, blockchain uses blockchain, uh, sorry, Bitcoin uses SHA 256. It's a known thing. So it's so agreed. Okay. The software, like the software that's provided, that facilitates all this is written by, of course, some people. And that's you have to use within that software and definition. That's called the, the agreed protocol. Oh, and how so things sorry, happen. Agreed. Yeah, it's okay, kind of exactly. Like, so Bitcoin just doesn't, like, it's not only the algorithm, it's just also, you know, you create something that you, that uses something. So you specify which one use. That's your choice. But that's what SHA256 is just what, uh, blockchain uh, so what uh, bitcoin uses ethereum uses different algorand uses something different but within the algorand everything is hashed in that what is agreed way if you hash it differently then it's different of course but it's it's exactly that that it's a protocol so every blockchain has a protocol as well you know that that, that needs to be determined pre so that means when the software is written that software is written based on certain protocol and choices and decisions. Okay, thanks. Okay. So what a transaction is, you normally is described as TXM. And these TX, different TXMs are what really is the ledger amounts. You know, if you if you remember there, like I was just showing you here, these are basically this different TXNs means just this one, the ID. So transaction number one, transaction number two, whatever. So they basically contain, it's just that you can think of them as a dictionary or whatever you want, but basically just these are, these are, there's a space of transactions that everyone, every time now, when I want to do some transaction, whatever type of transaction, I am just sending it to the cloud or that cloud means I broadcast them. The software that I use will just broadcast them, right? Because I just say, you know, I want to publish. And that's what node, the concept of node comes. Where are you transmitting? It's to a node or from a node, right? You must be a node. So now what, what node are you like to broadcast? Just like any, you know, broadcasting uh, television or whatever, you know, they, or a phone, a phone is a broadcaster, right? It, it, it's a node. A phone is actually a node within the telecommunication, right? Within the, within the, so it's just like that. There must be a node that's that is basically uh, like a mobile phone that is broadcasting, and it's broadcasting. There must be the receivers, right, that receives this thing. Um, so and then they basically aggregate. So there are different multi types of nodes, but in this case, you know, there must be a node. So usually, if you are not a node yourself, you can be a node because everybody can be a node. You know, that's what public blockchain means. Everyone, anyone can copy the whole transaction and be, become a node, advertise that they are a node. You know, that basically is buying like a phone and a SIM card. Okay, that's basically it. And, but these nodes basically send the signal, just generate. And then there are special types of nodes that are called miners, who from these cloud broadcasted ones collect some and organize them hash them and and make a block and a block is you know defined by a certain again the protocol defines how many transactions should be in one block a minimum and a maximum a minimum is usually zero but a maximum uh, because it, you know it is important the maximum uh, so that it controls the time so because if it's like a maximum infinity then you know it might take so long time before any confirmation but so that means, uh, you know, some people just pull, there might be million there and someone who's making a block actually makes a block, let's say uh, 1000 of them, depends. They select either randomly from that or they select based on if those who reward higher, you know, they basically, um, and then they select, but this process is then distributed. That means people are, all miners are trying to do the same. But the way that they select from this cloud is also different. You know, nobody cares about who you select. They, it's just you select randomly or you select based on a certain criteria. The point to make it to make it faster, this block, 
that's what's kind of proof of work and then proof of stake, whatever comes. But the faster you make it, and then there is proof in the proof of work concept, you basically select that. You, you know, the protocol defines how you are kind of chaining, and then there is uh, an effort that you have to generate. So that generate earlier I was showing you is that a hash, a block to create a block, it's slightly different. A block announces basically, you know, Bitcoin or whatever announces some form of uh, um, difficulty level. Difficulty level determines, and uh, for simplicity, the number of zeros a hash must have in the beginning. So that basically means, given that a hash, you know, like if I, I, earlier in a hash, I told you a small change, one, two, three, you know, four, like if I am just searching anything, it's changing, right? So I'm searching all the spaces, the all possible spaces in this case, until I get four digits zero in the beginning, right? So that's, let's say, the difficulty level is defined. When the difficulty level is defined, what you are searching is something, a number, it's called a nuance, that sets this thing zero, 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 four digits, because that's what you want. Uh, of course, the difficulty level can be increased. For example, Bitcoin, the difficulty level, most of the time is around 30 zeros. That means you really, it, it takes a long, long time. It's a, a huge computation to actually find that. This one is four digits, it's simpler, that's why my machine can do it, right? I can mine that. So let's say I, I can change the messaging. If I change the messaging, then hashing this means now the message is there. I, it's like I including, uh, you know, including different message, whatever, right? All these, I now wanna hash. So these are basically transactions that I selected. Now, all I have to do, other people are selected, other people must have selected some other things. All we have to do is now faster who's gonna get the mine, who's gonna mine. As I said, for this particular toy case, it's a four digits. So the mining is a processing, you see? Now suddenly, because it's simple, four digits is very not bad. So I get four digits, I mine. Exactly, then I say, okay, the nuance, I advertise the message plus the block with my nuance. And anyone in the network, of course, can confirm whether this nuance uh, for this data is actually a proper proof of work. Yes, they do. Basically, what they do, they don't search because those those ones, I already did the hard work. They, what they do just to confirm is that they take this one and then they take the data, they put together and they hash it. Then they, they look at the, the first four digits. Great. Yeah, this is a valid. That's what proof of work is. Great. Then that's passed. Now, faster I do it, then... Now, in the network, other people are doing it, but the faster I do it, then the nodes that uh, confirm, then confirm. Anyone, the next time someone is kind of trying to, to do the same, because like, you know, people are continuously, they of course search for the latest block that they trust. They, because they start from that. And then of course, the transactions that are inside them, you know, so you choose something else that are, that are not selected already. Then the block is, kind of built like that, okay? So users, so if you look at the, then the, the pathway, users initiate transaction using their digital signature that forms TXNs and puts it into basically broadcast it. Users broadcast their transaction to nodes and then one or more nodes begin validating each transaction basically by means selecting a set. Nodes aggregate validated transaction into blocks and then nodes broadcast blocks to each other, right? So and then consensus protocol is used, and then block reflecting true state is changed to prior block. Then it continues. This thing is just a merry-go-round. And the structure in terms of Bitcoin is like that. A block contains a list of transactions, the hash of the previous block, uh, the hash of the previous block, the hash of the entire block. So this hash is the hash of the entire block, and then uh, the root hash of the Merkle tree, that basically means the list of transactions is kind of, is structured as Merkle tree, as you can see it here. So each of the transactions in the bottom, but each of them then they get hashed as that, and then all of them, then they form one tree. And that's called the Merkle root tree, and that one is also part of the, the, the block. 
and then the previous block uh, hash and then a value and then some um, some elements like the the term just uh, different timestamps and, and and all that that makes it but these are small data let's say in very bytes or kilobytes maximum i mean really you can't get even kilobyte so the a block is a very very small data okay and then the next block and the next block and then the next block so you can see it's version uh timestamp nuance uh, earlier like the one that given this times the you know the hash of this all transactions ensures that anyone can check that this nuance is a proper proof of work for this trans you know for transaction for the target difficulty so earlier i said the target difficulty this target difficulty is defined in a certain way but you really can think of it as the number of zeros in the beginning that you are searching so that just defines that okay and that's it that's basically a block a block a block in a blockchain and it's um ethereum is different ethereum is basically ethereum as well as also now uh, algorand are different that's the first generation blockchain they are called second generation because they are more advanced and they know blockchain as you can think of it here there is no concept of account earlier it's a proper ledger it's basically like transactions defines if 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 in the transaction there is a name an account and that account is just some bitcoin uh, address that bitcoin address if at first they cannot send because they, they cannot be proper if they just send a new block a new account sending money you know it doesn't happen there's no it has no money so the first time uh, an account is created or they, it's not actually created intentionally but to really create an account in a bitcoin you must transfer to it some value some bitcoin basically then that account just basically a, a, some random you know some hash public key basically an account itself because it's part of the as just i described earlier while in blockchain and ethereum as well as algorand there is another concept it's not only um the contains such just simple blocks but it is a slightly complex block it has a block which has it has a storage it has accounts and it manages receipts as well as state route and transaction route so the ethereum block header contains the parent hash the same as um, before the beneficiary that's an account like that's actually created and then the difficulty level gas limit omer hash logs bloom this is basically receipts number gas use timestamp nuance mix hash extra data state root you know all of that it contains so slightly a complex that's why ethereum can do so many things that bitcoin can't right so um and the Merkle tree element is almost always of course every transaction is stored there and as you can see if anyone wants to change any single transaction it becomes falsified because you know the Merkle, the root tree will be error if you try to introduce some small change there like small change alice to eve instead of you know earlier was saying it sent uh, 15 btc but now you want to uh, tamper and then add it to 220 of course everything just becomes wrong everywhere like because this part of the tree is wrong so every part you know then suddenly this one because hash will be wrong so that's why it's blockchain is safe and if you really have a bitcoin block in c this is really a proper thing that's how it's defined earlier i showed you just that but really just this is the proper bitcoin um, transaction that's version number of inputs number of outputs uh, and timestamp and collection outputs okay okay and then basically a state when you think of in a blockchain it's basically what defines each state is defined by a transaction right so it starts from a state zero so if you have looked at state vectors that's really then the state changes every time a new transaction comes in and is applied the state moves from its zero state to the second the next state the next state the next state 
So transactions, any form of transactions change the state of a blockchain. Okay, and uh, that's really the number of accounts that you create are also transactions. Everything you, you create to change the system, it's called, yeah, so states, so they change it. Okay, Bitcoin, I'm not gonna, is not using the account. Its accounts are actually what they called transaction outputs, UTX source. And that's what, how it knows if an, an address has money or not. Only it has address, and that address is what it treats as an account, okay? Okay. And the difference between proof of stake and proof of work, earlier I was talking about proof of work, that basically someone confirms that they have got, um, they search for, for that difficulty level and nuance that would make the bunch of those transactions to be uh, to match the hard level. That's basically what it's saying is that find X such that if block plus X is less than T, it's a cryptographic hash. And if that is the case, it's just, you know, that is, it's called, this is basically time is the most important element in proof of work. You try to demonstrate based on computational power that you finish early and th that, you know, you validated it. And yeah, while in a proof of stake, it's basically different people who have different stakes are chosen and then they participate in a consensus. They, of course, there are different types of proof of stake, but they were taken um, and then they vote based on, you know, they stake something and all that, you know, there's a slight, a lot of complex proof of stake concepts, but they basically are randomly selected and they also um, lose if they make a mistake, special intentional mistake and stuff like that. And then basically they then confirm if everything is fine, then they get reward. But if not, they basically, of course, lose whatever they stake. And that's what's proof of stake. So I think I'm going to stop here because from here on, it's really a lot more about Ethereum. But I think the most basic com component of uh, blockchain I have described. So let's now talk with questions. Again, now to demonstrate blockchain, that's what it does. Okay. So what blockchain earlier, you just saw only one block. So there was, it was just not referring a chain. When it is a chain, it must refer back. You see the previous hash, this hash was this hash. Right? So the hash of the previous, so that they are, they are kind of blocks and chains, chain of blocks. Okay. And this one refers to this one. Now, if I change this one, let's imagine I add a new transaction called D. You see, everything else is changed here. Because every time you, you change somewhere here, the entire in the front of it changes. And really mining that is difficult. You know, I, then I have to mine each separately. I must mine now this one, then I must go and mine this one again. That is basically, then I, this time takes in the proof of work, even mining one is, you know, you can imagine it's hard mining multiple at the same time. And every time you mine something, other people are mining in front of you and you must correct. You must, so you must have basically the entire, at least 50% more computing power than the entire, the rest of the people to actually um, start competing even. And it's almost impossible. That's why blockchain is kind of considered, okay, you can't really cheat it. Okay. Gideon. Uh, so my question is, uh, so when we are mining, we're just uh, figuring it out, we're just trying to figure out what the nonce value is, and then we broadcast it to the, to the network, right? Plus the transactions, right? Okay, so... Because, so... because by transaction, I mean the data, you know, you see that it's the nuance for that data. Okay, uh, so the nuance in the data yeah, and, and uh, so and, uh, and then the, the previous nuance. so you, you're basically transmitting actually a header a block header right okay. so you and the, to... the hash has to have like a num uh, a certain number of zeros yeah. in front of it and that's no, the hash, mine... yeah you already determined so they, they when they it's called confirmation when they validate that's what they see you must okay. first search that 
then all you have to form is then a block and you form it based on that you know the software does it for you it's not you in a sense that uh, once you find once you mine the mine software it will just synthesize that for you and then broadcast it it broadcasts a block and the block must be then um you know must be validated by validators and then it's chained and then it's broadcasted again to the rest of the world and then things continue that way so you basically are so this the Merkel root hash and the list of transactions blah blah you broadcast okay so, so the level of difficulty is determined by the number of zeros in uh, that no it's that have to be uh, it's defined already before so every time it's changed so in the network you read it and then you have to associate of course like for that time okay it's part uh, of the and, my, and my other question is why, and do you know why? Just, just so that i can i can uh, even cement that understanding do you know why this this must be in part of the block the difficulty uh no you see like you want to control how fast transactions happen and so sometimes if transactions are very fast you want to increase the difficulty so that it's like blockchain uh, sorry bitcoin is around 10 seconds or whatever 10 minutes i'm not sure it's actually 10 minutes it's about 10 minutes time a bunch of transactions blocks are created every 10, 10 minutes now if it's less than that you can increase the difficulty if it is longer than that you can decrease the difficulty and you control the basically the the rate of blocks based on target difficulty okay okay, uh, okay so uh, my, my 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 second question is uh, why is mining uh, so much why is it more efficient while it's, it's done on a gpu instead of a cpu that's just a, a parallelized computing you know because that's what the, the whole the whole point of this cryptography uh, element is you're searching you're basically if you think of it it's really the nuance if, if we take this example you're searching numbers let's imagine i am i am starting one no it doesn't i mine it it doesn't so no, I, I am mining it, but if I am changing, if you can see one, no, it doesn't. Two, it's changing here. You can see here, the hash is changing, right? You can compare the number there. I am just, I can just search for one, no, two, no, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. See, I am mining this. Like I'm trying to mine. So when I am, I'm saying mine, it's actually really start doing that faster. In a programmatic way so now imagine if i can parallelize this and i make it matrix multiplication or something i get it faster so it's the same as you know cpus are not good for that kind of parallelization while gpus have you know thousands of computing and they can multiply matrix very fast so i can translate this mining into matrix multiplication and then I search for it and that's why yeah so specialized softwares can help you to do this faster than just that's a general purpose okay thank you yeah instead of also you know one GPU if you make it 100 CPUs that's even better right like you can parallelize this thing also it's parallelization that makes it faster. Okay. Mohamed? Um, so, um, I have a question. <clears throat> Can we use uh, machine learning and sup unsupervised learning for uh, determining how SHA-256 work so that we could um, provide proof of work earlier than uh, the mining nodes, the other mining nodes? Absolutely not. What and why? How? How that because, is? Because it's cryptography. It's cryptography. It's a. Uh, it's like you're. It's random number. So imagine trying to learn from a random number. There is no way. 
no one can cheat random number. Random number is random number because it's a random number. That means it's purely random. There's no, you know, machine learning or any learning can only learn patterns if there are patterns. If it's random, that's it. Uh, does there any experiments that use machine learning to do that and they failed? I, I think they would be very stupid, right, to do it, even to try it. What? You have to know mathematics is the the truth. If you are going against mathematics, then it's basically, you know, I mean, even the, the idea of trying, so you can't check. There are, of course, many big papers written how random is random. Okay, mm. but that's a mathematics problem, not not a learning problem. But you don't try to learn from random number, especially not from crypto. Now people are trying to crack based on other data sets, like humans maybe are putting words more than something. You can try to do that, but this is the software that is blockchain is designed. Uh, so messages, you can try to learn based on message. But the thing is, the thing about uh, hash earlier I was saying, what makes hash hash, you know, crib, you know, banks, why use it or why everybody uses it? Because a small change in, in the, so in this space, a tiny change here, like if I write like my name is, so, if I change now, a tiny thing here, the change in the hash has no, there is no way you would know the, 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 the distance between the two hashes is, is un, it's completely random. That's what it means, hash. So that means the input and output are uncorrelated at all. They are so random. So that means a tiny change is not tiny change in the hash. It's just another, it's completely, this, this my name is Mohammed Dot is not, can be so like, is it, so the hash between my name is Mohammed ver, versus my name is Mohammed Dot versus uh, empty. There is no way you would know which one is, which could be even empty. There's no way you would know that. The hash is just so random. That's what really elliptic curves are. They are independent of their inputs. They randomly map to these infinite, whatever dimensions that you give them. They randomly map. Okay. Thank Therefore, you. that means you will never learn the pattern from the message to the hash. So, but you can read, but I, you know, but the thing is, you cannot question mathematics. You can only question how the implementation of humans, whatever, but these are proofs, theorems. So, you know, basically the entire thing is built out of them and even including machine learning. So, you know, there is nothing that's not mathematics in what we do in some way. And mathematics, one thing we know for sure is that it's consistent. If you prove something is something, then you can't unprove it back. Whatever Euclid um, 2000 years ago have proved, it's still correct. So that's the advantage of mathematics. Uh, could it be uh, that randomness have some sort of patterns? Yeah, it doesn't. That's why otherwise it wouldn't, we wouldn't, right? <laughs> So the mathematics itself, we know it's random. It's proved it's random. Now the implementation, you might question because of floating, you know, how our computing at the, I don't know, hundreds of digits, what does it do? But, you know, that one is also not a pattern, the, the machine, you know, so it's, so the hardest part, the only thing that you do, even in quantum, why it's trying to solve it is not through pattern. It is through sheer number of trials. In quant quantum computing can process 
billions and billions in a second. That's why they can try to crack it. Because as you can see, cracking means trying so many times. Only, not a pattern. There's nothing pattern about it. It's a mathematics. So it is not a pattern, it's a mathematics, it's a theorem. Yeah, does that, does that address, Mohammed, your question? Okay, so hopefully, yes, and then that's it. Uh, we know computers are so predictive, so it is uh, unlike, I mean, we could generate random numbers, but it is not truly random. So uh, how this, how can we be sure that we, what we're getting is uh, purely random? Because like, there are some like mechanisms to generate purely random numbers, like entropy of radioactive elements and other sorts of like mechanisms, but in a computers are so predictive so how can we ensure that it is predictive? I, think, I think that's that's where really surely random numbers quality are different based on different algorithms that means usually it's called cycle you know their cycle can be small but within that known cycle they must be you know they must be random right so in a way it's just like if you come if if you are you know any random numbers uh, of course, and a property that is not studied about a certain function, you can find. But some of the, what we are saying that we are using is basically, so you could, there is competitions, right? In generating quality random number generators or quality cryptography, uh, like, like SHA 256, fast ones, whatever. But they are studied again and again and again and again to really, really, and, you know, so for all practical purposes, they are within, of course, they are not studied on, on a local machine. They are studied at, you know, the best computer that's out there, right? So we can rely on the randomness of the, like, the value we're getting. Yeah, so that, I think it's, uh, algorithm. The, only way, the, the only way you can think of something breaking is when someone has much more computational power than you have before. Because usually random uh, numbers are checked to a point that our computational thing allows us, right? Well, and, yeah. and when someone does pass that, you might fear that something they might discover that you haven't discovered before. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, and so, but random numbers from the mathematical side, don't you don't question them because, as I said, from a mathematical side, it's you might discover some some other property, but what is proved, you cannot unprove it back. You might discover other things that that helps you to do something, but still, if you prove something is random, then it's random. Okay, Gideon? Uh, so, like, a powerful enough computer could someday, like, crack this, uh, yeah. uh, this algorithm? Yeah. Okay, so... But, but the thing what's... is, that's what's called post-quantum, post, post you know, it's like, so now people are working on quantum, because quantum computing can really do, do, have, you know, can break these things easily. And so, I mean, not people are searching for post-quantum elements. Okay, but we have quantum computers, like it's in a in a yeah, research. But not, I mean, not, not state, space, yeah, but yeah. But again, like you know, people immediately when that comes, you know, you will generate with that, right? And then, you know, as I said, all all of everything your SSH you just generate new, the same as also in your you just generate a new unbreak, a new hash, a private key and, and public that within the quantum space, and then you just give it. Has and it then, been tested? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, already now quantum computers more. too. Yeah, yeah, I think this is this is an active research, an active development. Okay. So if you just search, you know, 
quantum crypto um, you know already there are minings with that okay so it's so there are many algorithms now that are generated to be even quantum proof so so quantum proof cryptocurrency are basically just all of the i think uh, ethereum whatever are in that sense that they, they are going to that so you can read more about them So these these are kind of you don't tomorrow you just don't don't get it like people really yeah first solve it and uh, yeah it's like yeah it, of course you know you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow someone might discover something crack something blah blah you know but for all practical purposes those who really uh, are working on it are the ones who are actually first gonna get it and then they are the ones who are protecting it so usually there is this element that it's a known element and most people even if you have quantum ethereum you don't just go and crack it um it's it's just that it's it's like your password being cracked right you don't fear every day that someone cracks your password. Of course, if they have enough computational thing, they might. But it's usually the easiest is if they get your password. Stealing is more still the most important way of cracking than, than cracking your network by random trial. Yeah, uh, I don't know who under net. Yeah, so the, I think, uh, uh, just uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but the proof of concept, uh, I mean, logic, I mean, that part, I think will prevent even quantum computers to successfully uh, crack each yes. node uh, yes. on parallel. So, like, there is a time delay, so it, is, it would be impossible to get into each node and uh, tamper with every node. Uh, yeah. in order to successfully like crack it or like hack it yeah yeah absolutely it's just almost god's exponentially hard so it is just for other elements that if you have it's actually usually quantum cryptography is not about the blockchain itself only mostly if it's for the private key given a public key you know you may be able to generate a private key the equivalent Again, that one by pure random test. You know, you're just basically generating, trying everything. You know, like, you know that the characters, it's 2048. Okay, now you're trying to generate 2048 characters randomly and trying um, if that is the, the, the same. And then, you know, of course, classical computers, they would impossible with quantum, those kind of computations can be faster. Okay. Ikubat uh, Sigi. Okay. Uh, so uh, the blockchain technology is based on the cryptography algorithm. So, uh, and we need the public key, private key, and the hashing algorithm. So where does the uh, distribution, uh, the concept of distribution, as we have said, uh, blockchain is distributed so that uh, where does uh, the distribution feature comes is my first question. And my second question is regarding the three blocks I have, uh, you have shown us the three blocks. Uh, so that are, this, are those blocks contain the same content or different? So uh, these things are not clear for me. Yeah, so the distribution is basically like every, everyone is doing it. It's not only you. You're basically, you can be a node. You're basically sending a transaction. Or if you are a node, you're basically selecting transactions from 
a cloud of transactions and then trying to put, create a block. Okay? Now, your transactions contain, as I said, if it's a block, a uh, Bitcoin, your transaction contains this. It has a version, number of inputs, uh, outputs, and then, you know, timestamp and that. So this is basically your class of the transaction you sent. Okay? This is basically what you call TX here. And your, because you, you contain, like this contains your, um, like basically the element of, this is vectors, right? Transaction input. And they contain your public key. So I think there, there should be, if I, if I go, there may be, so, uh to so the the protocol so normally there must be um bitcoin Yeah, so if we just look at one of them. So yeah, this is the kind of the inputs and outputs. Okay. Here is here is the address. And and yeah. So basically it will it will contain the address that you are sending as from which from which that you are sending it's the input part and then from the output part is the to whom you are sending okay and then the script of of course what you are sending you know, value you know whatever is you're, you're specifying so that's basically a transaction like the tx and and then you send that one and then a block is created do I answer your question or is your question? Because I, I feel your question is somehow a little bit confused in some way because you're not connecting what is distributed. But distributed is everybody is now sending it. There's no one storing, like there's no, it's not one person storing it. There's no centralized or whatever. It's just everybody stores everything. Every node stores it. Every node does that computation. And the reward for that node is to do it faster. But if some other node has done it, they, they would then also put it in their node to continue to be part of the communication. It's as if like, you know, the code is given, like let's say every block means every node must know what is the latest node, what is the latest block. Without that, they, they, are, they risk being in the back, basically old. If they are old, nobody accepts them, they, they just die out. So it's every blocks, every node's interest to be to start from the latest uh, block so they're always continuously aggregating the latest block and then they are trying to create if they're miners they're trying to create the late the next one faster and so everybody every node so in that case that bitcoin you know the number of nodes in bitcoin if you search bitcoin network it is now between 7,000 and 10,000, right? So that's, this is distributed. There are 7,000. If you, if you kill all of the 6,000, you know, if a government, let's imagine these are con distributed in, uh, let's imagine 10 countries or 100 countries. Now, if the US just imposes something, it can only, impose on the US machines, but the same network is everywhere. So still people can, so nobody, no one government, no one person can influence this. It's just, it's like a, if you know about um, BitTorrent or whatever, you know, it's like you can be that one as well. You can download a movie and then you can share the movie. 
someone can download from you. So nobody can really stop once the BitTorrent is created. Especially if it's, yeah, if it's like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, and these three are basically, they are not identical because why they are not identical? The transactions they are hashing are different. The timestamp is different. Uh, the nuance that makes this thing uh, validates that it is someone has found the, the nuance to be correct is different. So everything is different in that sense. The target difficulty could be the same or not with the previous one, but it could be different as well. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Okay. So any other question? Or by now, hopefully you got the idea of blockchain and you continue to march with your understanding of you know, intricate details about now Algorand and some other terminologies. Now, these are just the blockchain, the very first layer. You know, if you, if you want to think of it. So uh, I have listed as well this one for you. So when you think of Web3 stack, tech stack, you can think of it this way, okay? Uh, this. Okay, so you probably can see now, right? So the very first, it's called the state layer. So the very first, first part of the tech stack is called state layer. In state layer, you basically have the blockchain which stores, it's like basically the internet itself, right? It stores everything. It's in a distributed way. The files are in a distributed way. And then like basically blockchain, you can think of it DNS in, its, in itself, right? Just, it's just, it stores everything that is kind of, and then you have distributed file, distributed everything, um, such that this is fully distributed function. And then you have a computation layer. That means if, if a blockchain supports some kind of smart contract and others, then or including Bitcoin uh, for its transactional elements that, that, that computes, that's called the, bit, you know, the computational layer. And you normally that computational layer for Ethereum is or any uh, algorithm is the uh, virtual machine. So the AVM for Algorand virtual machine or EVM for Ethereum. And then of course you have file systems and virtual machines that are also sometimes can run. And then there's a component layer. Component layer means now whatever is sitting in that blockchain. So basically tokens are the very first um, generations, right? They basically are represented by an address and you know, it's basically a value. They are defined in a certain in a Bitcoin. Bitcoin is defined as 10 to the power of 18, whatever. And then you can divide it to the 10 to the minus 18 way. Ethereum is one, Ethereum is about 10 to 18 um, gas or you know, not gas, uh, wavy. And then they are defined by like a, a micro, um, whatever, YB, and then that, like that. Okay, so they are defined by a certain form, but in the, the you know first class asset versus second class asset is that in Bitcoin the first class asset is just a token, a Bitcoin. In Ethereum it's also Ether, but in Algorand the first it, it actual assets NFTs are first first layers. That means they really get it like they operate at the blockchain level. Okay, that's the component layer, and then there is a protocol layer. So sometimes you can use it as trading, you know derivatives whatever this one is used to build around so for example if you have nfts and nft exchange systems whatever are protocol layers okay and then the scalability or transfer layer so basically what others and you know user layer and application layer basically these are application layers are just the same as web2 that's the normal you know what humans are able to access the front ends And control layer, wallets, whatever, are on the user control layer. Again, these are just abstractions. But the main things are, of course, everything runs on the state. Okay. Hopefully that makes it clear. 
And now you will proceed in the next couple of days, of course, exploring the different components, Algorand, uh, the Algo, Algorand blockchain has. And that will allow you to understand how to access, transfer, create NFTs, as well as other standard assets. Uh, as well as tokens look, such as, I mean, Algo, you know, NFT is also token, the same as these other tokens, including Algo, which is the, the financial uh, token. Okay, and then that. Uh, can you just briefly uh, tell us what is the difference between uh, blockchains like Ethereum and Algorand? Just well, I mean, uh, the most important difference, as you can see, is that in blockchain, there's only uh, in uh, Ethereum, there's only one native as asset, which is Ether. That means the memory can only store one thing. It's called in as its part is token, and the rest is stored as code, which means basically smart contract. So if you were to create smart contracts in uh, NFTs in Ethereum, you have to write a smart contract. I mean, it's a code that defines how NF, that NFT acts, basically, which wraps around uh, that image, whatever thing. And you, you are the one who writes a code to turn certain thing into a smart, uh, into an uh, NFT. So NFT in a block, in a Ethereum is just basically a smart contract. But Algorand has included many more things as its first token. You know, by first token, it means in its account address. It has, yeah, it, it, the, the memory structure and the EVM or the virtual machine structure and compute is very different. As well as also, of course, their, how they verify. Uh, Algorand is using proof of stake. It's called pure proof of stake. While Ethereum is using, at least so far, proof of work, but it's, I think it has migrated now to proof of stake as well, but different types of proof of stake. There are multiple types of proof of stake. So, but you know, you can think of it as just basically there are different chains, networks, the way that they like the most every essential element, including the code that they use, how they are built, and what whatever is different. Everything. Are our current like are are they open source? As it is open source. I mean, there's no there's no public. It all are public. We you know. Most of these bigger exchanged ones are public. I think you don't hear that much um, private network. That means uh, everything is open source. I mean, if you are a blockchain and if you are not open source, then what is the point? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you have you. to check. Everybody has to check what has been done to trust. So trust is established by a court, not by you know, authority. Okay, great. Awesome. I think you will have tomorrow also more tutorials, hands on, hopefully. Um, and then you will keep understanding more and more. Cheers, guys. And uh, Ten Academy team, you can stop recording. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Bye.